Hi, everyone. Can I get your attention, please? Um, it's a pleasure for me to present the last panel. Um, this panel was curated by our art curator, Daniela Silvestrin. And um, it's basically a pleasure to me to um, moderate the last one. This panel brings the essence of the festival to the conference room. So basically, we're going to be talking to artists, um, to scientists, and uh, we're also going to be exploring the interface of uh, science and art, which is actually the, the essence and the spirit of the festival. Another important thing um, to mention is uh, that we're very happy that we managed to gather um, a big amount of people. It's been, uh, we've been doing a lot of work. It's, uh, it's been uh, long days of curating, reading scientific papers, talking to the artists, talking to the researchers in order to bring the field of emotions. We created a, a program that basically addressed from the nature of emotions, the history of emotions. We look at the 17th, the 18th century. We wrap it up. We look at uh, what emotions are chemically, biologically, uh, techniques addressing the nature of emotions um, to the basic uh, psychology praxis and uh, also looking at uh, psychopathologies. We address the field of autism, emotions being quantified and emotions being sold as data. We looked afterwards at the facial recognition technologies and um, for those who were here in the last panel, we look at artificial intelligence and we are finally wrapping up our conference with uh, some science and art. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce. Um, we're going to have three speakers. So we're going to start first with Professor Manfred Hill. So Professor Hill, he lectures in the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, the TU Berlin. And his research is mainly uh, focused on robotics, dynamical systems theory, Neural networks, we heard already about neural networks before. And um, during the AI talk, self-referentiality, which is something really interesting it's going to tell us about that Mark is actually going to follow up on. And um, actually, besides from all the academic, technological, and scientific achievements from uh, Professor Hill, one of the reasons why he's here is because he's open for the collaboration of uh, science and art. So we've got any artists that are interested in collaborating with uh, Professor Hild, he will be looking forward to talk to you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him to please come to stage and tell us a bit about his research. So thank you so much that you... Uh, spent uh, the Saturday uh, afternoon here to learn something new. I was uh, asked to tell first something a little bit about uh, the research topics that we are doing at the Neuro Robotics Research Lab, and then um, maybe give a few uh, insights or an overview of collaboration, uh, collaboration uh, that we did with artists. And so let's start. First of all, um, if you want to do robotics, you need many, many people. So these are the current colleagues in the lab, and they focus on uh, audio, on video processing, on behavioral programming, on neural networks, and so on. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea that uh, it's, hard, uh, it's hard to do robotics uh, or humanoid robotics uh, if this is of a bigger size, uh, with few people. Uh, then here we have, of course, a history of robots that we built in the past. And as you see, uh, there's many different uh, robots, like small ones, bigger ones. There's swarm robotics and so on. And at the bottom right, you see uh, the Mayon robot, or two of them, one with the white shells and one without. And maybe some of you have seen those robots already, actually, especially in Berlin. Uh, in Berlin, we have eventually presentations where you can get closer to uh, have an interaction with the robot as well. Now, <clears throat> there's uh, many things that we do, but just to sum it up, there's actually uh, 
like four levels that we are active in. Uh, let's start with the bottom one. So we are actually interested in um, fabric. So which means where is actually the calculation uh, done? Of course, we know in the brain we have neurons and it's like a wet wear, whereas at the computer we have uh, silicon-based uh, devices. But there's many things in between. And we just started to go into printed electronics, which means that you really build the electronical devices, not only the circuit board, but really the devices by printing methodology. It's very expensive. It's some half a million or something. You need really expensive machines. But of course, it's a nice adventure to look out for new electronic devices which have properties like, for example, synapses. So memoristic research, memoristers you may have heard of, um, is also one topic which can be done you know, with those technologies. Then there's uh, the second um, from the bottom, uh, which is low-level sensory motor control. And there I will give a few examples, or one example with a few videos, uh, what can be done there. Uh, then we have high-level behavioral control, and last but not least, uh, human-machine interaction, something that is then maybe the uh, collaborative point together with Marco and others. Now, you, you have heard of um, neural networks, and you may know a lot about robotics. And of course, then you know that normally what is done, that you have a processor, um, normally with cooling somewhere in the body or in the head, and then everything is connected to there, which means you have many cables which can break easily, especially if uh, body parts are moving all the time. Um, so this is like a centralized approach. And people do research about uh, decentralized distributed processing in swarm robotics, but normally not with complex machines where the parts do different things. So this is uh, one of the main topics that we repeat over and over and try to solve things in a min minimalistic way. And um, this brings you to the question, if you just stop thinking as normally an engineer would do, uh, which is, if I want to detect touch, I probably need a touch sensor and so on. I mean, this is how uh, uh, engineers think normally. I know because I am one. And um, <clears throat> yes, and uh, actually everybody's educated that way. I mean, uh, it starts in school and then in university or at university and um, you are taught the whole life that uh, you need a XYZ sensor to detect, to detect XYZ. But actually what's happening here, it's a continuous uh, exchange of energy. So we have a wire uh, that's not that interesting, but if you then put it into the form, into the shape of a coil, then you get from electricity to uh, magnetic forces. And it, or if you put it in between a magnet, then you have uh, mechanical forces, and you can have a gear, and then you get from the mechanical world through the uh, um, magnetic world into the electronic world. And you can actually do it in both ways. This is... Uh, even true for LEDs or things which normally you would think of, they only emit light, but the reverse is also true. If you send light into an LED, we have a, a photo current coming out of there. And so this is what we use, just to do it briefly. And here is a small uh, Lego experiment. I'm sure some of you know this uh, from your childhood. And this is all plastics, and it's a DC motor, and there's a very, very tiny electrical cir or electronic circuit in between, which makes this motor go against external forces. And here is, of course, the gravitational force, which tr tries to drag this uh, rod, this, this uh, small wheel down, and therefore it's going the other direction, namely up. Now, this is maybe nice and uh, um, not that interesting in itself, but what happens if you use an aluminum rod and get into touch with this uh, pendulum, if you like, you can detect this touch. I mean, you can, actually the truth is, you cannot touch anything without exerting a force at this object. And this here uh, is detected and used, so this is an example of a touch sensor, which will still work if you cut off half of this pendulum, then the remaining rest will still work as shown here. 
And this is, of course, very interesting for robots because there's so many parts. The humanoid robot uh, Myon consists of uh, 50,000 uh, single parts which are assembled. And if something breaks, it's good if the rest can still achieve something. So those principles are not only simple and small, but they are also very robust. Now watch this. Here we have three joints. It's uh, the foot, the, uh, the knee, and uh, the ankle joint. Here the hip joint. And the same principle as with the Lego motor is applied without communication between those joints. Actually, the communication is actually the, the, uh, the forces in the leg itself. You can build this with, um, okay, let, let me switch the sound off. Uh, you can do this <clears throat> with uh, glass or wood or whatever. You can actually encapsulate the motor and the battery in this small principle uh, and it will still work. I will show later on uh, robots which have random morphology. You can just put them together in any way and they will go up because they go against the gravitational force. Um, then maybe a note about the design principles. So one thing that we uh, try always to use is a high degree of modularity. This you can um, do in, in many aspects. And one aspect is, of course, that you have modules of the body which you can attach and re detach and reattach. But also the internal design. Normally those robots have big motors for, let's say, uh, the ankle or the knee and small motors for the hand and for the elbow maybe. And we are using only one type of actuator, so the price goes down. And we know this actuator type very well. And then we mix more actuators, say four, to the same joint, which gives us a kind of an antagonistic drive. We can do like in biology, muscle and muscle which goes against this. Uh, so there's new paradigms possible with that. There's many other advantages, but one of it is you can just try out different morphologies and play around with other configurations, which is normally not possible if you buy a machine like 200,000 euros, a humanoid robot, which is not uh, built out of modules. Uh, this is another advantage. We are actually continuously uh, exchanging parts of the robot, building better or other ways, like example, there is a two-point gripper, and now we have this soft robotics hand, and the same is true for electronics and everything in, in the robot. Here is an example of these multi-actuated joints. As you can see, there is three motors, and they are mixed. Their forces are mixed uh, through ropes at the, uh, the joint, and here you see a, a movement that is done with a neural network, but of course, um, this is just actually a, an, an experimentation platform. So the robot is not built to help in the household or so. Uh, although this is the most frequent questions that we actually get, uh, but it's built to be a research vehicle to address our uh, research topics, which is what are the minimalistic, the basic building blocks of intelligence or of, what, uh, of things that produce behaviors that could probably judged as being smart in some way. Now, regarding those electronical processing, the fabric, that is one uh, topic that we address, we also build this without microcontrollers. Most often, uh, this paradigm that you have seen go against external forces, which makes, makes a single leg stand up, um, can also be built completely electronically, even only with transistors. And uh, then you can, of course, connect it to analog processing. This is kind of an analog synthesizer, which is then uh, augmented by modules which connect this audio world with the world of forces, of body and forces, so you can interact. So this will be part of uh, or one option that could potentially be explored in a collaboration with Marco in his projects. I'm sure you will see how this could go together during his presentation. Uh, then maybe a few closing remarks um, about uh, collaborations. So the first thing is dance, theater, opera. This is always, uh, excuse the wording, a pain in the ass because normal researchers are in the lab and if you go out and do rehearse, uh, rehearsing over weeks, everything else has to stop. 
right? And so part of the lab is, of course, students, and they have to go to lectures and write exam and all that. And such a production like the uh, My Fair My Square Lady at the Komische Oper last year um, was a big uh, break to the whole team because they were just in charge of transporting the robot from the leg and back and forth and so on. So yes, we are actually open to uh, collaboration between um, research and art, but uh, you have to make sure that it's not uh, too much, otherwise you are stuck over the years, right? So these are some pictures out of this uh, production, and there uh, the deal was that we do not uh, use the robot as a puppet, I mean, what you, of course, can do is the Walt Disney uh, approach and say, well, it's like a, um, a guy in the show which does this if this happens, like scripted uh, puppets. Uh, and we said, well, if, if you want us to do this, then we are not in. Uh, so the only way that we can do this, we try to continue with our research topics. We put the machine there, and then you can interact uh, because otherwise you would have needed, I, I think, 30, 30 guys which would really uh, program until their fingers are bleeding um, because alone standing up, sitting down or walking a few steps is normally tasks where you have a PhD student or several uh, diploma students working on that over one or two years. So um, uh, people uh, in arts have a huge imagination and this is, of course, uh, important, and this is why those pieces of art are so uh, extraordinary. But uh, as it gets to be grounded in the real world, uh, roboticists eventually have to calculate if uh, they can do it with their team. Now, but uh, sometimes there was a, uh, sometimes it's possible, and this is another production which was uh, shown. Was it one or two years ago? My God, time is going by so quickly. I think it's already two years ago in Zurich. Uh, this was a theater play about artificial intelligence, about prosthetic limbs and all that. And so this robot Semni, which is normally like 30 centimeters, it's actually a robot I built. Uh, if I'm on the train or on vacation, I want to just f find something else, then I have a robot there to do it. Uh, and this was built like uh, in two meter size and was interacting in the dance choreography with the dancer uh, because it's about force and getting in contact with the same principle that you just saw with the Lego motor. So there is no contact sensor, it's very minimalistic, only the motor and a bit of electronics does the trick. Um, here's another part of the uh, my, f my Square Lady scene there has been exhibited that the robot also continues to work, to function if you drag the parts apart. So um, if you have an arm or a single leg or something, um, you can still do research with that. And um, that's, of course, of great help in the lab. Normally, those teams have one very expensive humanoid robot. And here we have single parts. So normally, if you visit the lab, you have one guy with a head and one guy with a torso and two legs and the other one only has a torso, the head, and an arm to see hand-eye coordination. So that's very handy, actually. Uh, here was conducting the, uh, this was, of course, nice, and I have to confess, uh, the full orchestra uh, waiting for this robot just to do uh, this and that, so. And, uh, yeah, so how many minutes do I have left over? Like two, or am I over already? Uh, you got another four. Uh, which means I'm at 20 minutes now? Okay, so it, two will be sufficient. Uh, about the morphological design, I quickly go through there. So this is the shape of this semi robot, which I uh, designed so that I can take it in, in the baggy pack. And this was an exhibition in uh, Paris. I was to Paris for two years. And um, there was in the Maison Rouge an art exhibition where I just put it and it was like a kinetic sculpture doing what it did. And, uh, I mean, yes, I, I mean, I can give another talk on that, but I mean, it's, it's not important. Uh, interestingly, then people go there and watch those pieces of art, and I get in contact with uh, Shunji Yamanaka, uh, which is a product designer, which is also very 
uh, very skilled in doing nice constructions, and he took the principle and this uh, was designing very nice creatures. You see here a few sketches of him. And eventually, one of his students made this apostrophe, which uh, got the nomination at the uh, Ars Electronica. So eventually, you, a piece of art comes out there, which exhibits these principles and there you can interact. There's videos also on, on, uh, on YouTube where you see how people interact with this. And I'm closing uh, with this uh, video clip where many of those different morphologies um, had been put in front of an audience. And I mean, this is just before the fair opened, but if you go, oh, there are the sketches. And here, um, and this is maybe the link to emotions. Uh, of course, these machines do not have emotions, but um, arouse, arise emotions in people. Uh, those principles uh, have a specific feeling. I mean, if people interact, they feel like it's, it's stubborn or it goes its own way and so on. Uh, that's maybe also a starting point to be elaborated on within arts. I thank you very much and uh, hope the next talk will continue on it. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred. It's been yeah, quite inspiring what robots can do and the new advances now on the tail. And it's obviously very nice for the art community to know that there's people who want to collaborate and further pursue um, new dialogue in the field of science and art. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Marco. So Marco is a performance artist and scholar. His, uh, main research of his main interest of research is human-machine configuration. Um, I don't know if you've seen his uh, pieces of art or his performance, but he, if you haven't, I highly encourage you to see or to visit what he's, you have it upstairs, right? And you can also see it online, I've been watching it online as well. He works with autonomous prothesis. He explores the relationship between objection and intimacy. And what is actually interesting for me is that he takes, he walks the extra mile and he interacts with biosensors, whether they are cognitive or corporeal, um, and translate this into sound. The main thing about this work is that he also learns from the machine. So the machines, we've been talking about machine learning, machines are learning from us, or machines eventually learn from their algor uh, the algorithms that we've been feeding them. But he, not, he does not only learn from the machine, but he's also learning how to be affected from the machine, right, in the field of affection. So he gets feedback and he reacts to the feedback. Um, Eventually, that will, from what he explained to me, that will produce, or he will react to that in a cognitive or probably not a cognitive level, and that will feed the machine again, and then he will learn from that again. So I think this is a very interesting conceptual approach that he has brought to the festival, and I'm, I have nothing else to say. I may just <laughs> give him, <laughs> let him explain his work. So... There we are. Screen? Yes. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, yeah, um, performance artist and scholar, um, starting a research fellowship at UDK in Berlin, which, about which we'll talk uh, very shortly. And um, I, I do create technologies for my own work. Um, so, and I work mostly with physiological computing. It's also that something that Pablo mentioned. So I create technologies using sensors, hardware, and software that capture different kind of biosignals from my body or body, visitors of bodies, and um, use this signal to inform the way machines behave during performance. Um, one of these technologies, for instance, is the accents, which is a wearable biophysical sensor. So this, in particular, amplifies the sound from within the body and extracts information about muscular activity, which that you can use in interactive performances. So my interest lies in this convergence between body, sound, and technology. And 
why I'm interested in that, because I believe this convergence is pretty much about politics. Um, so all of this comes from my um, transdisciplinary background. So I studied um, performing arts at Academy of Fine Arts in Italy. I studied a sound designer in Edinburgh. I got a PhD in computing and body theory at Goldsmith in London. And um, this allowed me through the years to get to this understanding of how sound and machine have the capability of producing hybrid bodies. So a very simple example, raves back in the 90s. Uh, raves was much more than going to dance somewhere. It was a culture movement. And um, you know, people would get together in the order of 100, if not 1,000, and stand in front of big sounding machine speakers and experiencing this incredibly long uh, lasting and uh, ob often loud sonic experiences. Um, of course, including uh, taking drugs, taking them in a relational way, and um, all together take, contribute to take part in a ritual where sound machines and human bodies were all equally contributing and participating in this process. So in this case, you can perhaps start to imagine how these kind of bodies have cultural and political value. But to get more to the point, uh, another interesting relation uh, that shows the political value of sound machines and bodies is, for instance, the use of these kind of jets in warfare territories. Uh, these jets are used to produce sonic booms, which are incredibly loud and low frequency, which you can actually see visualized as the line on each side of the jet. To produce these sounds at a very low altitude, just to scare people by engaging their bodies with, with this really loud and low vibration. Something like an earthquake, but much stronger and much uh, abrupt. So this brings a bit more into the concepts that, that I explore with my artistic research. Um, so I'm, I, I look at the ways in which repetition, shock, and pain produce or disrupt or reinforce specific kind of normative bodies, normalized bodies. So those kind of bodies that we perceive as normal in our society. And um, let's talk about a couple of examples of all my work. Uh, so coming from performance art, I extend performance art with emerging technologies. So in this case, for instance, I'm uh, pulling this 25 kilos block of concrete in a circle for 20 minutes and using a biophysical instrument that I showed you earlier, I'm amplifying the sound from the blood flowing in my veins and the muscles contracting and bones crackling and transducing these into digital data that are accumulated by the computational platform and translated into sound and visual. And this action is purposely focused on repetition and endurance. Uh, and the purpose is to use this kind of technology together with this combination of performance art practice to affect physically the audience. So it's not just about attending to this piece of action art, it's actually about being completely and physically engaged by it through the strong vibration that are amplified from my body and escape through the loudspeaker and enter the bodies of the audience listening there. Um, another example is, is this other installation for one visitor at a time. Uh, this takes place in a very small booth. And um, as a visitor, you get to sit there and take off your shirt and wear one of these biophysical sensors that capture your heartbeat and your respiration, uh, which drive a uh, sound and light system. Uh, but most importantly, on this chair you're sitting, uh, it's embedded with uh, some um, uh, acoustic transducer that take the sound from your body, amplify them, and feed them back to your body again 
uh, by means of acoustic vibration, mechanical vibration of your skull, your spine, and your lower part of the body. And while you're experiencing this, you, you can watch yourself into a mirror, which you lit up with your breath, which dry the LED in there. So what happens there, it's basically I'm using, I'm abusing biofeedback techniques to create this, this environment of hypersaturated stimulation. And when the human body is subjected to uh, saturation of stimulus, start just to make up stimulus. Uh, because it cannot understand what, what's happening. And that's what happened in the installation. Every person has a very different experience. Uh, some have more visual kind of hallucinations, some other feel things within their body, uh, like falling even though you're just sitting, or feeling of somebody being touched. And again here, I exploit the differences of the body and I amplify this difference of bodies by creating this kind of work. So uh, coming more to the scientific and computational part, um, back three years ago when I started my PhD, uh, I started looking at machine learning and how I could implement those in the artistic practice that I just showed you. Uh, so this, this is a small diagram that we were um, we were sketching together with Dr. Baptiste Caramieux at Goldsmith in London, uh, which was about an agent-based system. So basically a computational agent that does not only learn, but it can also take initiative, take action within certain environment and within a uh, certain system of inputs and outputs. So basically that turned out in um, my latest performance. I'm gonna show you just 30 seconds of it. And, and here, perhaps comes through more clearly um, the way I'm investigating uh, these normative bodies and other kind of bodies. So basically what you see there is my own body illuminated by um, an autonomous system uh, which just run on a computer. And uh, as Pablo mentioned earlier, I, um, I'm using two sensors on my forearm to capture two different kinds of biosignals from my body, acoustic biosignal and electrical ones. And uh, these data are sent to these uh, um, I don't like the word intelligent, but okay, autonomous system, that understand the different characteristic of my muscular activity as I'm moving, and in response to this muscular activity and to this feature, create different light patterns, they were a different way of lighting up my body, and uh, create also different uh, sound patterns. And the sound are in partly generated by the machine itself and in partly reflected by my muscular activities as well. There's sonifying directly certain frequencies that are coming from within my body. So, this is pretty much what I use the term human machine configuration. So, it's not human machine interaction. It's not even a reactive system. It's literally about being configured, arranged together, body and machine, in order to produce a kind, new kind of body. And uh, this is what I've talked about in my PhD, and it's uh, exactly what I'm, I'm 
trying to develop now with uh, this new collaboration with Manfred, Profield. And um, the basic starting point is, is to examine the, the, the capability of autonomous robot to play music and movement in a bodily integration with human performer. So I'm collaborating with, uh, with Prof. Hild, but also with Prof. Alberto De Campo from Dudeca, uh, with the support also of Hack the Body uh, from Baltan Laboratories in the Undertal. Um, so just to abstract some keyword here, what I'm interested in is the hybrid characteristic of the human machine bodies. The way they are relational, so they mutually relate to each other. Again, it's, it's something that goes beyond interaction. It's just about being affected by the other. So how the machine affects the body, but also how the body affects the machine. Which brings us to the third point, which is how do we decide between being in control of the machine or just incorporating it within our body? And what's the difference between that? So the reason, the reason why the collaboration with Prof. Hild it is just so punctual for me, I'm very happy this is happening, is that the importance of autonomous robots, it, it's not that they are just physical, but they are embodied. So as, as Prof. Hild just showed before with some of the videos, uh, the, the computational platform will just not work without the sensor and the hardware being placed there. So this machine have a certain capability to understand their own body, understand also their own body within that environment. And this, for performance practice, is incredibly fascinating. Um, we've seen already plenty of these, but why not another more? And so this, just to wrap up, uh, brings up the, the, the main question that I'm asking myself and hope to bring forward with future artworks. Um, so the question of human-machine corporeality. So corporeality is just a term to include the way we are embodied, the way we understand the world through our body, but also the politics that drive this kind of understanding that we have of our bodies and of others' bodies. And in my mind, uh, this dimension works across these two ed edges of, of control, as I said before, and uh, incorporation. And there is a fine line that differentiates these, these, two, these two edges. And what I want to mostly focus on is just the part in between. So what lies with in between controlling a machine and incorporating a machine brings up two other dimensions of the problem, which is the problem of intimacy with the machine and the one of objection. You can feel intimacy even with your laptop every day. Just imagine how awkward it is to use the laptop of somebody else that you are not used to, or the telephone of somebody else. That's already a hint of intimacy. Um, but there is much more into thinking about objection. So just think, what, you, what do you feel about seeing people with the robotic prosthesis? Uh, objection in itself doesn't, have, doesn't bring any negative exception, but it's there. It's just like a feeling that we have. So I'm interested in exploring these kind of dimensions, uh, working with embodied robotics. And it, all of these can be wrapped up with this notion, which is clearly paradoxical, of autonomous prosthesis. Can we have one? Do we want them? What they can do? Uh, so these are some of the questions that I want to explore uh, through these four fundamental items. So physiological communication, so communicating with the machine through biosignal, through muscular activity, through this understanding of our bodily feeling through performance. Improvisation, which, which ties up with co-creation with the machine. So not having a puppet there on stage, but actually having another entity that can somewhat intelligently improvise with a human performer. And then mutual learning. So again, being affected by the machine, affecting the machine at the same time, and learning through this process, through repetition and training. 
And finally, bodily integration. To which extent we can integrate a machine into the body and the body into a machine? To which extent this kind of integration can be perceived as an intimate one or something that brings us objection? And why is that? So that's all for me now. Thank you. Is on. Um, I would like to continue with Tarek. So Tarek work, uh, works in the Digital Media Lab in the University of Bremen. We actually met a couple of years ago during the Falling Wolves. I was uh, actually impressed by what he showed. It was absolutely, it was uh, stunning the stuff he showed. It was shock, shocking for everybody. The audience voted for your talk, I remember this. And uh, yeah, it, it just drew a lot of attention to his research. Um, his, research his research mainly focuses in artificial intelligence and cognition. In the field of computational creativity, we can probably say that he's on the second or the third generation uh, leading um, computational creativity in the more or less the path of Margaret Bowden for those who last week uh, attended to the talk from Margaret Bowden, you're probably familiar. Uh, besides from that, I can, I can just let, uh, let him talk about this. <laughs> okay. Being the computer scientist on stage, or the second computer scientist on stage, first of all, I have to figure out how to actually change to my talk. Let's take that one. And here we go. So, um, Quo Vadis Computational Creativity. I'm the third musketeer on stage here, and I probably will contribute the third perspective, and I actually want to invite you to join me in asking what creativity actually is. So, is there such a thing in the first place? And if so, is there one thing? Is it several? And what do we think creativity is, and also what should it be? We will take a little detour, namely through computers. And yeah, just come with me and we'll see. So, first of all, creativity is one of the buzzwords of the 21st century, right? Like, everyone is expected to be creative, to be a thought leader, be it either in your standard job or if you happen to wash up on a stage, you always should somehow give a creative impression. But where does creativity actually happen? There's a couple of classical suspects, for example, music, which you would hear if it was muted, um, for example, paintings, or going into the 21st century computer games. But clearly, who are the creative people here? The composers, the musicians, the painters. And the guy on the lower right actually is Richard Garriott, who some of you might recognize. He was a fairly famous computer programmer in the 90s. But there's also more creative people. Like there are mathematicians such as Emmy Noether. There are scientists such as Marie Curie. Um, there is people with black turtlenecks such as Stevie Jobs. And there is actually also random toddlers. So all of them are creative in their own ways, be it that the random toddler just discovers that, oh, this is impressive, two plus two is actually four, and I can continue that onwards, be it that Stevie Job accidentally designs Apple Max, or be it that Vivaldi actually composes yet another sonata. So what is it we guys are doing for work? So the computational creativity community, we somehow try to get the people on the left running on the thing on the right. But what's the big problem? Well, at least in common perception, creativity is taken as this, quoting Doctor Who, colorful mumbo jumbo. So something's happening there, it's inspiration, it's zeitgeist, it's emotion, it's a bit of drunkenness, it's occasionally just hitting one's head against something. So there's lots of things coming together, but how do we get that going on the brutally logical, on the brutally computational side? This is the basic question computational creativity tries to answer. And by this also, we try to answer in ways what is creativity. So if things go well, 
eventually we will get creativity into computers or computers into creativity, which might be two completely different things, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So let's have a guess at a definition of what computational creativity is. Why don't I go for a definition of creativity? Basically because there is none. There is working understanding, so if you open a business encyclopedia, what you get is that a creative act is the generation of something novel and useful. Now, the question would be, art, is usefulness really an applicable criterion there? Then you also have the definitions which say, well, whenever you provide a solution to a problem which is novel and efficient, but can every creative act really be characterized as problem solving? So is there always an actual problem? As at least my community, since the days of Maggie Bowden, didn't figure how to really grasp that, we settled on trying to define the computational flavors thereof. And the two gentlemen you see on the lower side, on the left, from your point of view, Simon Colton, on the right, Geraint Wiggins, they gave probably the most used definition now, computational creativity is the philosophy, science, and engineering of computational systems, which, by taking on particular responsibilities, exhibit behaviors that unbiased observers would deem creative. I want to direct your attention to two things there. A, by taking on particular responsibilities. So this definition is fairly broad. On the one hand, we can go for co-creative systems, which already have been mentioned, where actually you have a human interact with the system. If you drive it, and if you continue long enough, you will have a fully autonomous system. Secondly, it's about exhibiting behaviors that unbiased observers would deem creative. As I said, I want to dive into what creativity is or can be with you. So here, mind, behaviors that unbiased observers would deem creative. Most of you might be reminded of some other AI, well, gambler's trick, which always comes up in every decent AI lecture, namely the Turing test. So originally conceived by Alan Turing in 1951, I believe, for testing whether a computer is intelligent, the question was, phrasing it a bit incorrectly, if I have a well, a screen interface, screen keyboard, to interact with, on the one hand, a computer, on the other hand, a human. The moment where I cannot tell the computer from the human by the replies they give to my questions to them, wouldn't I have to actually consider the computer intelligent? What's the, it's a bit of a slingshot argument. So the basic premise is, yes, humans are intelligent. We show our intelligence via communication. So if we rip off everything which is visual, everything which is perceptual, if we only go for the content, if we can't tell machine from man, wouldn't we have to deem both intelligent? So now let's have a look at what we people are doing in computational creativity. And you for yourself try to see how much you would grant the system, whether it's intelligent or not. Here you're looking at some output of JAPE, the Joke Analysis and Production Engine. It's been developed by Grammy Ritchie and a couple of guys since the mid-90s, and basically JAPE is asking these pun questions. What's the difference between money and a bottom? One you spare in bank, the other you bear in spank. What's the difference between gardening and driving? One you brush and rake, the other you rush and break. What do you call a strange market? Yes, I'm going to go through all of them. What do you call a strange market? A bizarre bazaar. And what do you call a sick bird? Well, an illegal. So it's, it's very obvious how this is working, right? And it's blatantly stupid. Nonetheless, if I keep repeating a couple of them, some of you take mercy upon me and start laughing. So at least it seems to be going somewhere in the direction of humor. Still, is the machine actually creative in creating these? We can continue on the textual level. So what you're looking at here is Mexica. Mexica is a system developed by Rafael Pérez y Pérez at the University of Mexico. And Mexica basically is writing Mexican-style poetry. So Inca, it's a bit of a cultural glitch there, but at least he's trying to go for that. Never mind that the Incas never made it to Mexico. Um, so I don't know whether you can actually read it. I will just start from the top. Jaguar Knight was an inhabitant of the Great Tenochtitlan. Princess was an inhabitant of Great Tenochtitlan. Tlaloc, the god of the rain, was angry and sent a storm. 
The heavy rain damaged the old wooden bridge. When Jaguar Knight tried to cross the river, the bridge collapsed, injuring badly Jaguar Knight's head. Princess knew that Jaguar Knight could die, and the princess had to do something about it. Princess had heard that the Tepesco Weetle was an effective curative plant. So Princess prepared a plasma and applied it to Jaguar Knight's wounds. It worked, and Jaguar Knight started to recuperate. Jaguar Knight realized the princess' determination had saved Jaguar Knight's life. So then it carries on, and all of a sudden a bad enemy appears and kidnaps the princess. And of course, Jaguar Knight has nothing better to do than to go for the enemy, who, by the way, in the meantime, gets also a bit of a beating from the princess. Eventually, Jaguar Knight actually kills the bad enemy. Um, then we're at about the middle of the thing. Um, they have the, well, necessary kiss, but then, oh, tragedy arrives. Princess, when just making out with Jaguar Knight, figures that he's wearing a tattoo which identifies him as a sworn enemy of her father. So all she can do is basically to cut his jugular and have him bleed to death on the ground, following which she figures that this is kind of sad, so she also cuts her own throat and bleeds to death on the ground. While, wait a second, Tonatiu, the god representing the sun, disappeared in the horizon. Basically, this entire story is generated by Mexica. It's a very simple system. So, as you might have figured, the story I just told you, if you rip off the cultural references, could be a random telenovela or a random Hollywood blockbuster, right? You have a bit of a romantic encounter, then a bad guy appears, you have to slay him, in the end you have a bit of drama, and okay, here we don't go for the comedic relief, here we just go for everyone bleeding. Still, um, basically, it's a rule-based system which puts together a story from a constraint base, so you know, well, I'm three minutes into the story, now maybe something cute should appear, seven minutes, we need a bit of tragedy, or if you go for telenovelas, well, five episodes without some new hottie showing up, seven episodes without a breakup. It's fairly automatizable. And by the way, there are automatized telenovelas being produced. But we already push it further. So here you get the story. And for example, um, Pablo Gervas in Madrid, he's doing Russian folktales. Russian folktales are literally reducible to 128 constraints. Then, painting. Nevar, neuroevolutionary art, which is a system by Pinus Al Machado from Portugal. What you're doing here is that you write a program. The program produces some visual output. You judge the visual output. You say, is it appealing or not? You take some lines of the program, you mix them up. So you just change the order, which changes what appears on the picture. You do mutation, if you want to go into a biological metaphor. Once you mutate 10 different forms, you select the five you like, you discard the other five. These five, you randomly mix up the code again. And so you have something that looks like Darwinian evolution, which is driven by your own likings, but in a way, you do not directly influence the evolution of the picture. You just say, I like it, I don't like it. And what actually is happening at art school? So if you start drawing there, what are your teachers doing? They give you some constraints, but mostly they tell you, no, you're out, or, well, wait a second, I'm going to buy a couple of these and we're going to talk in 10 years when I'm rich. So it is a bit of a guided process. Talking about art, this is probably the most famous system, Harold Cohen's Aaron. Um, you see Harold Cohen standing there, you see Aaron in front of him, which basically is a gigantic robotic plotter, and on the right-hand side, you see one of the pictures. So... Does anyone want to guess why it's called Aaron? Basically, he thought he would build several and he needed a name starting on double A in order to then count up. Um, so what you see there is a program started in the 60s where he basically sat down and programmed a couple of curves. But then he continued on throughout the 70s, throughout the 80s. He just always added to the program. He never deleted. And he just always added in new rules. And already after 10, 15 years, Cohen was claiming he has no clue what the system is doing. He just keeps feeding in things, but basically Aaron is autonomous. He continued that until, well, earlier this year when Harold Cohen actually died. Nonetheless, Aaron keeps producing. And no one knows what exactly Aaron is doing there because it's just a gigantic piece of code which is outputting paintings. Well, there is also a more modern version to that called The Painting Fool, which is Simon Colton's system. What you're looking at here is basically a rendering of ballet dancers. 
Um, there is a bit of background theory using the traveling salesman in order to determine where the paintbrush should go, but this doesn't matter for the moment. What matters is that here you basically have one 18 kilometer long brush stroke. The painting fool does not lift off the brush on this painting. At least to someone who's not trained in painting or in visual arts, this thing looks pretty good to me. And now the question would be, okay, you've got one 18 kilometer long stroke. I don't think that a human painter would do that unless he's on life support. But there, there we already reached the boundary where we're like, okay, it is doing things we could never do. So what are we pushing here? And now comes a bit of an interactive part. So I've shown you plenty of systems. Actually, just four, but hey. Um, and now I just want to get a bit of your opinion. So where does the painter start? Not necessarily computational, maybe also in real life. Is it enough to call someone a painter if he or she is capable of reproducing a visual scene? Who would say yes? Okay. So you basically consider your Lumix cameras a painter, right? So if I'm able to reproduce a visual scene and I can adapt color and style to information contained in the scene. So if I'm able to say, well, okay, the guy sitting portrait just seems somehow depressed, like his facial expression is indicating that, so I rather paint him grayish, or I rather go for an impressionist style. Um, if I have a woman sitting there who's totally um, happy, she's radiating, I might rather go for a warm color palette, and I might rather, I don't know, go a bit cubist crazy, or whatever you have, right? So if I'm able to do that, who would say we are talking about a painter? I at least expect the hands I saw before. <laughs> okay, well, actually, we're either still talking a Lumix camera, Photoshop, or any other medium elaborate photo editing system. So what about if I'm not only able to adapt to what I see or what the system sees, but if I'm able to adapt to what actually is happening in the world? So make, well, take 9-11. If I open the newspaper on the morning where they report about it, and I'm like, you yeah, know, this can't be, what has the world come to? Which makes me sad as the painter. And following this, this might once again impact on what colors I paint, what style I pick, what motif I pick. Or just take Germany winning the Soccer World Championship. I might just be the crazy soccer fan painter and I go totally haywire and I paint an 80 kilometer long brush stroke. So if I'm able to tap into these context phenomena, am I a painter now? If I'm also able to just like recognize emotions and to reproduce a visual scene? And then what about if I'm also able to just say, no, I don't paint. So if I now open up Twitter and I see that, um, say, looking a bit into the future, the US elections took an unfortunate turn. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna paint anymore. So does this then finally make me the artist if I haven't been an artist before? Okay. And then of course, um, artists have to live as well. So what about if I can do all of these and I manage to sell my stuff on the general art market? So not going for the fringe computer art where I have all these fractals, but if I actually have exhibitions and galleries next to other artists, does this make me an artist? Does this make me a painter? Everyone who would agree on the last one, you just agreed that the painting fool is a painter. Because the painting fool is reproducing visual scenes, it's actually just taking, for example, from faces, the way your mouth points, the way your eyebrows are oriented, and it's picking colors. It has at around 110, 120 palettes matching between style and color it can do. It's actually listening in on Twitter. It does a pretty simple trend analysis looking at what are the adjectives which currently are mostly used. Are they happy? Are they sad? It has a, a random function where it tells every, I don't know, 15 coin flips, please get lost. But it also, once again, uses Twitter and Google searches to say, yeah, no, it seems the world is in peril. I'd rather stop painting. 
And the Painting Fool had exhibitions in Paris and London, and also the artworks are selling in general gallery, uh, galleries. So are we talking about a painter? Would you actually be willing to say, OK, that's it. Computation has reached creativity. Let's go back to the definition. What happened? So, does the painting fool take on particular responsibilities? Yeah. He's tapping into the, the atmosphere, the context, the zeitgeist. Um, does it exhibit behaviors that unbiased observers would deem creative? Well, it's producing an art piece which has a color pattern adapted to emotions and context, and it even occasionally tells me to not, well, to get lost because it claims not to be in the mood. And by the way, the latest feature it can do is that it also produces a narrative. So using what it finds on Twitter and on Google search, it just puts out a story telling you, well, precisely because there was another end of the ceasefire in Syria, I'm in the mood to paint gray. How is this different in behavior from an artist? And if you now have to say it isn't, but you're still hesitant to say that the painting fool is an artist, the question is, what's the missing link? Is the behavior really enough? So is it really enough to, to behave like an artist, to, sorry, be moody, to actually be empathetic to what happens, to just produce art, to produce artifacts? Or is the question more like, do we want this to be enough? As I said, my community, we failed at defining what creativity is, and we consequently also fail at defining what art is, in a way. But maybe it's not definable in the proper sense. Like, maybe it's not definable like, well, a right angle has 90 degrees, um, a square has four equal sides. Maybe creativity is something a wee bit different. And maybe it just comes down to what we want it to be, because it's an ascribed property. Just putting this out there, right? We will have a podium discussion afterwards where all of you can chip in. But of course, if it is up to what we want, we just might have to take a decision eventually because, well, we are tingling on these machines and we are trying to get computation into the creative area. And I now focus in only on the artistic side, but I also mentioned random toddlers, TV Job, Marie Curie, Aminote, and there's much more. There is industrial design. There is people composing elevator channels. And by the way, the music you heard at the beginning, that's produced by a system called Emmy by David Cope. It's the perfect Vivaldi. It's too perfect. If you show it to an expert, they can tell you this can't be Vivaldi because it's the perfect average over all his works, which is how the system produces it. But still, we are there. We can do elevator jingles. And we can do little advertisement texts. We can summarize text. We can give you to an agency um, press outlet. We can give you a summary. So all of this is up. And now the question is, OK, what do we want to do? Do we want to say, granted? Creativity seemingly goes beyond human activity. Or do we just want to say, OK, no, this might be invention. This might even be innovative by times, or it might actually be innovative because it does not fall subject to the same restrictions we do. But might we nonetheless say, OK, no, creativity is a genuinely human trait we assign, we ascribe. And of course, then the question is, what is the differencia specifica between man and machine? And I'm not only saying this because I'm standing at the state festival on basically the topic, but it actually is that the one thing, artificial intelligence, cognitive science, we have no idea how to properly do is to imbue machines with emotions and not only talking about threshold values, but talking about perceiving emotions, about the quality. So do we want to go there and say it's only creative or it's only art if the one who created it actually felt it? Yeah. Off to you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, well, inspiring talk. Very nice. Um, I'm going to head towards the, um, the embodiment and the self-referentiality uh, field. I noticed that... Um, 
Manfred and Marco, you share some sort of like an interest in this. You are building robots that are, that are, that are basically, that you want them to be aware of themselves. And uh, self-referentiality is, is a big part of this. When, when I was talking to Marco, Marco said to me, uh, Professor Hild is putting ears on robots on, on both sides of the head. Um, what do you think uh, self-referentiality is going to bring, what it's bringing at the moment, and what it's going to bring to artificial intelligence um, in the future? That, that was the question for you. And in the same line, I will, I will, go, for, I will go for Marco. And um, you're already learning from the machines. Um, you address corporeality and embodiment in your work. What else could be done in that field? You are already, um, your body signals go to a machine and eventually, whether it, whether it is cognitive or corporeal, you get those signals back, you react to that, and then you keep on learning. What is, the, what is that bringing to your artwork? What's, uh, what's coming up next? And will that eventually be linked to, to the work from, um, from Manfred? And um, for Tarek, also in that field, you, um, you just mentioned we, we haven't really addressed the issue of what is creativity. You, in, in, our, in artificial creativity, I see that we've been feeding the machines with uh, a lot of information, loads of data. But um, I don't know if there has been, uh, it has been, a, of, 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 or if it's coming, some uh, embodiment or, or some other type of, of uh, you know, physical interaction. Um, I'm not saying that it's only one way at the moment. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, creative, uh, well, not only creative, but that pretty much analytical thinking when it comes to what to feed the machine, what comes out, think about it, and then feed it again. But um, what do you think could be done in addition? Maybe including some embodiment, maybe including some corporeal um, signals. I'm not saying that that will be the way to include the emotions, but um, maybe we could, we could include that. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let you go ahead. Um, okay, maybe my answer will be shorter than your question. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was how can self-referentiality uh, referentiality help robots or what, what can we expect from that? So uh, normally I include slides showing the computational paradigm as you had in your slide also, but I just left it out today. There we would have seen this very principle is the, the bare minimum of being self-referential. Normally you have a higher processor which tells every joint what to do, and it's of course a model which compute, computes uh, how the joints would have to behave. This principle, I, we call it cognitive sensory motor loop, actually uh, takes the own motor movement and integrates it and differentiate, uh, differentiate it. And normally this equals out. Yeah? Normally this gives the same as the input, but here it does not. And I mean, uh, we have had a discussion with control engineers and with professors of this and that. Actually, they all think, oh, it's so simple. It can, cannot do something interesting, but the point, is, as you have seen, it does. Uh, so the forces between the environment and the motor and then between the electricity between the motor and this very simple circuit does only work because we eventually take the motor voltage, reverse it, integrate it, send it back, and then this principle runs. So without uh, self-referentiality, we have to calculate everything in advance, and the point is that this robustness completely uh, goes away. So arbitrary robots that stand up is only possible because each joint does its simple thing and then you arrange them together and it's still working. Each other robot would have to recalculate for each joint what to do and when to reverse the direction and this is completely gone due to self-referentiality. I stop here. So 
Well, I think I'll start from the personal and try to get to the general. So um, in my work, the fact of using this kind of feedback between physiological signal and, and the computational platform is already enabling different ways of, of, of thinking of bodily performance or bodily experience through artistic means. Um, it's, it's a way that has to do with, with effects, which is like the lower level of emotion. So what comes before emotion? Emotion is something that we rationalize already. Um, so using this kind of physiological communication within the human and the machine, you can, you can give access to this low level of effect. So um, reaction and experiences that you feel in your guts before they actually materialize as anger, love, fear, or whatever. And at the general level, expanding this by implementing it together with embodied robotics um, opens up loads of different implications. Uh, implications that I think are, are uh, dangerously overlooked so far. So at the moment with robotics we have, in arts, uh, we have a lot of painting machines, as, as we have seen in this other talk. Uh, we have sometimes some robots that are using human bodies or help them doing something. Uh, but we're really missing an artistic exploration of what the bodily experience with these robots will be. And um, we're just overlooking something that will be fundamental just in a few years, not even a decade. Uh, because when robots will be all around us to help us doing things and whatnot, to nurse our kids and to do all this kind of stuff, so we will not have the tools to understand or expect or imagine what, what our bodies will feel and what these other bodies, robotic bodies, will feel. So, again, I'm starting from the personal to the general. I think there is a great need of exploring uh, what does it mean to have a body in the face of embodied robotics and in the face of intelligent robotics that have bodies and how this will be important in, in, in terms of what do we define identity, how do we define our own bodies and so on, because AI will change all of this. Okay, I think there's two dimensions in which embodiment can and will most likely be relevant for the, the computational creativity side. The one is the, the more immediate one, which already basically both of you showed in your slides and hinted at, namely the, the interactive paradigm. So there's many more forms of art than just painting and music, which are very perceptual but very passive on the side of the, the audience. Um, one of the projects I really like, although it's still very rudimentary, but it's going in an interesting direction, is called Robodanza. So you have one of these little humanoids, I think it's a now, and it basically reacts to rhythm and visual input it hears. So they are touring Europe, and basically you have that little humanoid standing on the table, then you start clapping a rhythm, and you start moving, and he, well, let's call him he, um, he actually starts improvising to that rhythm as well. So you get into this feedback loop and in this back and forth interaction. This is the, the immediate part where I think we are also slowly but surely in the position to use robots. But the, the way more conceptual question is that computational creativity, whilst we are great in generating, like computers can generate a lot of ideas or a lot of concepts in a short time, we totally suck at judging which are the good ones. So we cannot really appreciate or evaluate. Probably, this is due, now I have to tie into emotions, due to the fact that I think lots of our appreciation for art or for creativity is emotionally based. So we feel what we like, it's somehow appealing and it's, it also find some consensus. So, of course, one can argue about art, but there is many pieces where we all agree that this is good and that this somehow speaks to us. But this speaking to us, I think, is very phenomenology-based. So, it is something we feel because we have effects, we have emotions, and we know how they feel. We don't only have the physiological part, but we feel them. 
And at least the pure computational paradigm this far completely failed at getting there, which is why we hope that when you go more embodied, maybe robotics or what have you, we eventually will push in that direction at least. I'm not sure whether we ever will get there to have the full-blown data and switching on his emotional chip. I'm not sure whether we want that, different topic, but at least we might be able to get in that direction. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to follow up also on um, co-creation in computational creativity. Um, first with Marco, we, we, we've seen co-creation in your artwork, and um, could you please further talk about that? And um, also back to, to Tarek, you previously worked in the math and music project uh, with autonomic composers in the problem solving side and also in the artistic side. What was your experience? Uh, and, um, that will be in music and is there any other example of co-creation in music um, or like that will be adapted to painting or sculpture or something else? So that, that will basically be. So, yeah, I guess um, what what differentiates our approaches uh, is a focus not just on generating output in my case, um, which calls for bodily contact and bodily experience. So, in in this sense. Um, the, the issue of incorporating technology is, is quite fundamental. And um, it's, it also depends on, on the way we decide to incorporate technologies. Um, so we had the hype of wearables, nobody wants them anymore, but there was like a couple of years that were like, the best thing ever happened to Earth. Um, but just five years earlier, nobody would have worn any sensor on their body. So there is a certain dynamics in the way how culturally and socially we perceive technology and the way we perceive them on our bodies and within our bodies. Um, so in this sense, as, as this machine gets more creative um, or more reliable and safe, because that's also a problem, to have with and within our bodies, then we're going to see more of these ways of incorporating machines and the way we can co-create with them. My interest is more on the bodily side, but this will bring for sure more uh, into computational creativity research areas as well. Thanks, Marco. Once again, there's, there's at least two ways of co-creating. One which is already very common. So, for example, if you Picture yourself as a designer, as an industrial designer, and you have a design task. So you know you should design a new bathtub. Um, you have certain constraints, you know about the size, you know about the material, you probably know about the rough style. Then what you usually do, at least I've been told you usually do that, is that you go back to a book with lots of images of existing bathtubs, mm -hmm. and you go through them to see whether you find inspiration. Many of them might not be relevant because they are the wrong size, they are the wrong material, what have you, right? And of course, this you can easily let a computer do to just immediately sort out the ones which might be relevant and get rid of the superfluous crap. So this is one form of co-creation where you just delegate automatizable tasks. The more interesting form is also what goes once again in your direction is, for example, um, in music, Francois Pachet's flow machines. So there, you actually interact with a computational musician the, the machine takes up on the lead sheet, on the melody of what you play. It plays it back to you. You play it back, the machine starts to vary it slightly. You react to what it varies. It varies it again. It doubles it up. It goes into a choral form. Um, if you're interested in that, for example, when you get home today, have a look at YouTube, Francois Paché, Flow Machines, Ode to Joy. Amazing. If you ever want to hear Enrico Morricone's version of Ode to Joy, pretty cool. Um, or what goes even further, and this is, I think, pretty much what you are doing in a way, is take a brain-computer interface, a simple household EEG, put it onto a conductor's head, have him conduct a orchestra, but at the same time 
get an audio stream from what the recordings are. So basically you get a stream of his perception, of his action, and the orchestra will react again. And then you have this co-creation where actually you have the human and the machine in the loop. So yeah. Right, thank you very much. Before I open it to, to the public, I just want to ask you something very quickly. What is the current state of uh, do-it-yourself, some DIY technologies? Has it facilitated the artwork? How is the DIY um, stepping into the lab? And yeah, obviously, in your, in your field, what is the current state? Is it opening? Is it opening up? Is it bringing stuff? And um, yeah, what would you recommend to people out there looking forward to do artwork, to do research, and to explore new fields? As for robotics, um, well, the situation is quite nice. I mean, there's a big gap between huge machines, uh, which are expensive, and large teams like we are doing in the lab. But that's not a problem. Actually, everybody can start, and I myself also started uh, with cheap uh, motors, and I mean, uh, doing um, small electronic circuits and building uh, machine parts. That's actually quite nice to start with, and a bit of programming. So I think there's... Uh, uh, everybody's entry into that world. Uh, it's about not get, getting lost in just doing fancy stuff or, for example, like robots who mirror image what you are doing. I mean, if you want to take it serious, then you have to think about what is your goal? Where do you want to go? Not what's the goal for the robot, but what, one, what do you want to explore? I'm b building robots just for helping people is something completely different uh, than using them to get some insight in questions that you may want to address. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I started myself with totally DIY stuff, and I'm still with it. Um, so um, I, I don't have an academic study in uh, biomedical engineering, but I've been studying it for the past four years uh, to create all these sensors that I use and so on. So again, as Manfred says, if, if you want to get into this field, it's it's relatively easy today, and uh, it's just about immersing oneself into the right resources uh, and get accustomed to different ways of developing, prototyping, and there are plenty of resources around. Well, I think some of you may have seen the puppy robots upstairs. Uh, there are also plenty of other robotics kits uh, uh, that are available, and also for sensing technologies, we, we have very plenty of, of different boards, so you will know the Arduino. There are also much powerful uh, computer credit sides, credit card sides computer that can be used for, uh, for mobile and then wearable platform. So there is plenty to do. Just a brief remark. Um, as, as to where are we in this do-it-yourself uh, robotics thing, so what I one example that I did like at the Ars Electronica this year was self-surgery. Uh, it's not all ridiculous, so it's about building devices that you can use to do minimal invasive surgery with yourself. I mean, it does not yet work, but it's not uh, meant completely as a joke. Um, eventually, one can get there. I mean, it's maybe then in 10 years or so, but, but by combining printed... Um, 3D printers, uh, plastics, and motors, and software interface. It's quite impressive, so if you want to watch out this, it can eventually happen. Nice. Okay, um, speaking, at least trying to speak for the computational creativity community, there is plenty of do-it-yourself on the internet. So, um, among others, last month, something called Prosecco, promoting the scientific exploration of computational creativity, and don't ask me how they got the ending O into the acronym, um, ended, and they still have the webpage online. There's lots of resources about how to build your own Twitter bot, about how to get your small musical improvisation engines going. And a second project in that direction I want to mention, although it's still very rudimentary, actually is hosted at Goldsmiths London. It's called Flower. And this is a collection of software modules, which should make it very easy for, say, the semi-ambitious programmer to just put them together, interface them, and see what happens. So the community is providing modules with nice interfaces. You plug them together, and the magic starts, or not. Thank yeah. you. All right, any questions? 
Um, here. Um, if you can get the microphone, or or if you can get to the microphone. Mm, I think the topic of art and computers together is very interesting. Creativity, computer, computerized, computer creativity, um, because it makes us think um, what is being a human being? What is a human being? A human being is just a lot of a mechanical thing that you can reproduce and a machine can also produce art the way a human being produces art. What is that missing part? What is not there? I haven't heard the word soul <laughs> being spoken today, but I was shocked because um, it's not a religious thing. It's probably what some people consider the missing component. And I just want to make a, um, give an example of where that part is missing in the art that a computer can create. When you talk about the patterns, like um, in stories, for example, this, this computer uh, program that Mexica or this Russian fairy tale has been recreated, that wasn't discovered by computers, this pattern that exists in literature. The, the Russian formalists in the 1910s and 20s, and afterwards the structuralists already recognized those patterns in every story. So uh, Vladimir Pope already said, like, every Russian fairy tale has someone that wants something and some helpers and the pattern, which a machine can only reprodu reproduce in different combinations and create something that might have the illusion of being a work of art. But what is missing? I would call it the soul, and that would be this unique perspective that only one human being can have. I would call it a blick or a perspective, which is how you use the components that every story has, how you use, it is a very, um, it's a pattern. It's exactly, you don't have a lot of uh, resources, but each human being would just use them in a different way, in a very unique way that a machine can give you the illusion that it's doing it, but it's just doing it randomly. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, was, was that a question? No, yes, I would really like a reply. Can we do a quick reply, so... Um... Okay, um, first of all, I very much appreciate talking about these things in English because English has the word mind, which saves me from having to use the German Seele. Um, secondly, basically what you ask is the, the question for the possibility of an artificial mind. So, uh, presumably, if you are a reductionist, you would say neurons in the brain do a kind of electrochemical computation and then you are in the corner where you have a hard time arguing why this should not be possible on a silicate computer. Unless you sign up for the necessity that brains make minds and then of course we've lost. Like then AI, yeah, uh, we better find some other jobs as science fiction writers or what have you. But guess on what side I am. Uh, Manfred wants to step in. <laughs> well, I think um, what units are doing the calculation, if it's real neurons or silicon, that's not that important. The, uh, the main issue is actually um, history or let's say a personal experience. So what can eventually be found on a robot, not yet, but eventually, is... Um, a history of things that has been experienced, the own story of the robot. I mean, if something is living or switched on, say, for years and can tell stories that have, have been uh, experienced with the own body. I mean, I'm not talking about a piece of software connected to the internet. It's about an entity which has borders between itself and the environment. And these borders are, we talked about self-referentiality, are detectable can say, this situation I have been in three times, it was three years ago, and then I broke my arm or whatever. So these kind of things could potentially also a machine relate to a story or something the machine sees. Um, and this is of course missing from Simon, um, Simon's software, which is painting and so on. It's there with Francois Pachet's uh, music loop where you have uh, the intimacy of you influence something, it's influencing you back and so on. 
and Pierre-Yves Audier, of course, has done a lot of work on that. So there are systems which go more or less in this direction, but yet, I mean, even though Mayon is writing uh, episodic memory over the years of the opera and what, when, whenever it was switched on, still the algorithms are missing, which can properly um, relate those past things that happened to the robot or with the robot to what's actually happening right now. But this is the main difference. Is there something uh, from the past that you that also defines your continuity? If the robot is switched in, can it say, can it say, well, this is my body. I'm, oh yeah, this is working like I, it always does. And then you have kind of a continuity of the existence. I mean, it's still not a soul and nothing, but that's here it goes, starts. But this software has no notion of what it's going to do. That's my answer. Do we have another question? Quick question. Oh, can I add something to this? <laughs> Wait a oh, second. Oh, yeah, you want to answer? Yeah, 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 definitely. No, because that's a very good question. And um, I, I do agree with what you say. So I think also. Um, to equate uh, machine and human is, is basically a wrong assumption. In the state of the art that we have now, machine cannot, cannot really reflect on themselves. Maybe they could in the future, we don't know yet. Uh, but as they are now, they cannot. And my personal opinion is that even if in the future a consciousness, an artificial consciousness will arise, it will still be wrong to equate it to a human one because it's just completely different. Even if its own body is just different mainly than, than a human one. As any other animal has a consciousness and it's certainly very different from a human one. But that's already very far in the future. All right, thank you. Can we go ahead over there? Thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up. But I, uh, by the way, I, I agree with what Simon just said. And I just want to run it to the ground in terms of the philosophy of mind. What the machine uh, doesn't have and never could have is imagination. Uh, and imagination is at, the, uh, is at the root of all of this. And the reason it couldn't have it is because we built, at least from one conception, which I would defend, I realize reductionists would try to attack it. Uh, but in imagination, that is ultimately the faculty of freedom. And we're talking about a system in, in a robot which is in principle deterministic. And uh, I would say at least from one point of view, you would argue that there, there, is, uh, there are degrees of freedom, as it were, in the human package. And a machine would never have that. We got four microphones here. Yeah, well, I understand what you're saying, but mm, very, very easy systems, like you take the logistic uh, map, which is a mathematical one-liner, so I'm talking about chaos theory, shows that the, the, the slightest amount of system noise already can break symmetry. So mm, b something being completely deterministic, like the, the, the uh, algorithm can be deterministic, but still the output after a few seconds is depending on the initial condition at such a high degree that it's random, although the underlying algorithm is completely deterministic. And if you think about a robot, I mean, there are so many sensors, you have an Im uh, immanent level of noise, Having said this, now you would argue, okay, so this is then like random dices. But now let's switch to humans or to animals. You may know uh, Mr. Roth, who says there's no such thing as a free will. Of course, a very extreme position. But there's a famous experiments where you, like Marco does, um, take biosignals, which show that they are precursors of things you are about to do, like the negative potential and other stuff, um, the Bereitschaftspotential, which can be measured quite before the point where you say, this is now the um, aware point where I decided to press the left or right button. So, of course, we cannot answer this question, but I would just try to break you down a little bit by being so extreme. So it could be um, that um, machines can have kind of an imagination and that they can have kind of an own will, whatever this would be. Um, but being mechanically or 
in other ways, defined does not mean, uh, does not rule out creativity or will. Thank you. Do you guys want to answer or any Thanks quick, you. very quick question so we can, um, we got, right over there. You, Hold on, you gotta be here, get the microphone. Uh, hello, yeah. uh, with uh, biometric data, uh, can you teach the machine how do we feel? So, analyzing uh, all our brain, all our heartbeat, uh, how do we feel about uh, one uh, art piece? How I feel, how you feel, how other people feel, and so teach the machine a little how to feel better. Yes. Thank you, Manfred. Oh, it's the other one. This, this, this one. Yeah. Of course, you can do this and it's done, but uh, it's boring. I mean, it's a high level of skill that scientists do that, but it does not mean that this algorithm or this machine has a notion of what's going on. I mean, this is also the, the difference between uh, Simon Colton's work. There's no awareness, so it's pattern recognition. It's the same as Siri and other Google things. I mean, they're doing a great job and helping us, but Siri does not understand that it's you and what you really want, but the people behind Siri are using then the, those informations. That's an important difference, right? Thank you very much. Um, any further questions Next or answers? Question. Just, just, Go ahead. just a note, very, very fast note. Um, yeah, I think also that this, this points to another issue, which I think is very really important. I'm just going to hint at it here, so maybe people will think about it later. I think we're, we're also witnessing a very demanding spectacularization of all this kind of technology. <laughs> and, and this is very important to keep in mind. I mean, like, the work that Manfred is doing is, is quite edgy, and, and, and it's, it's very important. And it's nothing like uh, Google is doing, is doing pattern recognition, or Siri is doing. And this is, is a whole different world of research, which is really important. It's edgy as well, but it has nothing to do with, with uh, creating singularity or things like that, as some from people from Google would like us to believe. Cool, thank you. Daniela, do you want to add something? Hello? Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just one comment rather than a question, or a comment and a question um, to Tarek mainly. Uh, what somehow bothered me a little bit in your talk was that you were mixing two words a little bit indifferently and that was creativity and artists and I think in the whole reflection about it these things if you go that deep into finding definitions then these have to be very uh, yeah reflected about distinctively so I think being creative doesn't automatically be mean to be an artist or yeah, at the same time. And um, the second, or the question actually was then, in how far have you worked together with artists maybe also, or had the exchange in your, the whole reflection with artists to uh, find definitions about creativity? Okay, so I personally was involved, as um, Pablo already mentioned, in a European project trying to combine Basically, it was about concept blending, so about how humans combine disjunct concepts, house and boat, into boathouse or houseboat, and how we could use this either in mathematics for theory combination or in music for the automatic combination of harmonies. So how would a Bach madrigal have sounded if the Beatles would have harmonized it? And um, in that context, I had plenty of interaction with, with musicians, for example. And I actually kind of purposefully conflate these two, and I'm very grateful that you pointed out, because this is also one of the questions. I would just ask it the other way around. So does being an artist automatically mean that I'm creative? Basically, where, where do you draw the line for an artist as well, right? So Beethoven, in the moment where he composes the Eroica, he's breaking with everything which was before him. He's picking up on what is happening. He's picking up on the French revolutionary spirit. What if you... This is, I think, undoubtedly a great creative moment. Um, when Cubism starts, there is great creativity, or usually people ascribe it. Nonetheless, it is not ex nihilo. So cubism you can trace back to Riemann's lecture when he took over the chair in, I think, formal mathematics, 1856, and he broke with classical geometry. Beethoven's Eroica you can trace back to everything that was going on with the French Revolution and the change in time. 
So it is not out of nothingness, first of all. Meaning that, okay, we can maybe build up to it. But secondly, um, the, the more important part I want to make about artists and creativity, okay, Beethoven, big thing. But what about all these so-called Kleinmeister? So the ones who composed in his style, who were perfect in the school of classical music, but who never changed the school, are they creative? And in this moment, if you would say, okay, they are creative, then the computation of flavor comes in again, because then you actually equate creation itself, not the strong breaking of paradigms, but creation itself in a domain with creativity. But you're right, it's, it's totally shaky. Like, unquestioned, equating art with creativity, I shouldn't do that in public. Still, it happens all the time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just following up on what you said, where do we draw the line? Do we draw the line here, or do we draw the line here? <laughs> yeah, so just to mention the, um, the best approach for science and art and to bring inter interesting discussions to the table is to lower the barriers of our scientific or academic disciplines. That will be the only way by allowing the hackers, allowing the artists into the labs and allowing the academics to explore other disciplines. Um, I guess that will be the message. And, um, Besides from that, I would like to thank you all for coming. Thank you also in the name of the festival. It's because of the audience that we get this running. And um, also invite you to the film that's going to be screened here at uh, 5 p.m. is uh, it's going to be actually the singularity. And um, we know that Mark is already cracking it because he's already learning from the machine. So um, without further more, I would like to yeah, close the panel. Thank you all, and thanks to, for the inspiring talks. Cheers. <laughs>